Federalist 37, Part 3. Please make sure you watch Part 1 of this Federalist before reading along with me. And uh, notice that my, my phone's keyboard is down, so when I upload these, I'm not going to be able to put the Federalist number and the part. Uh, so I'm hoping that just showing it here will help. And this is OU, the University of Oklahoma. I'm giving him thumbs up. Okay, we're at paragraph three of Federalist 37. Persons of this character will proceed to an examination of the plan submitted by the convention, not only without a disposition to find or to magnify faults, but, Phil, but we'll see the propriety of reflecting that a faultless plan was not to be expected, nor will they barely make allowances for the errors which may be chargeable on the fallibility to which the convention, as a body of men, were liable, but will keep in mind that they themselves are also are but men and ought not to assume an infallibility in rejudging the fallible opinions of others. So here, remember, it reflects on the uh, first two paragraphs. He says there are some people that are not open-minded because uh, they are thinking about their own pockets. They are rejecting this new constitution from the beginning without even... Uh, paying attention to what we say and uh, what we've done in this convention, but there are people out there that they love their country and they're going to recognize that human beings are fallible. And when you go, when you put a group of 55 men from different backgrounds to try to solve and come up with a plan, there's going to be lots of compromises. And, uh, the plan won't be perfect. And we're hoping that you Americans who love your country will not listen to these people who are saying the negative things just because they have sinister and awful motives. But you love your country and you remember that you are also a human being and you are fallible. So you, you have to expect, you can't be expecting something perfect. Okay. With equal readiness will it be perceived that besides these inducements to candor, many allowances ought to be made for the difficulties inherent in the very nature of the undertaking referred to the convention. The novelty of the undertaking immediately strikes us. The novelty of the undertaking immediately what is he saying? He's saying this is the first time almost in human history that free thinking people have got together with multiple different interests in a convention and have come up with a plan to establish a great republic. He says in the past, as you remember in Federalist number one, he says up to now we've always had tyrants and dictators and generals uh, ruling us. Either, either a king becomes a tyrant, a dictator, and takes all the power and all the money goes to the king and his or the queen's court, or a, a savage military man comes and dominates you and you have no rights. He says, this is for the first time that a group of human beings have got together, come up with a plan, and they are sending it to you and asking you to deliberate on it, think about it deeply, and uh, in special conventions that you send your representative and delegates to, decide whether you want this or not. He says this has never been done before. So that's why he says the novelty of the undertaking immediately strikes us. It has been shown in the course of these papers 
that the existing confederation is founded on principles which are fallacious, that we must consequently change this first foundation and with it the superstructure resting upon it. It has been shown that the other confederacies which could be consulted as precedents have been vitiated by the same erroneous principles and can therefore furnish no other light than that of beacons which give warning of the course to be shunned without pointing out that which ought to be pursued. The most that the convention could do in such a situation was to avoid the errors suggested by the past experience of other countries as well as our own and to provide a convenient mode of rectifying their own errors as future experience may unfold. Remember in Federalist 18, 19, and 20, Hamilton and Madison went through the experience of the past confederacies. He says, we've done that, we've studied those, we've learned from them. And even though we've learned from them, it is our own wisdom, it's our own, our own deliberation that tells us where we can go now. They might have shown us where the rocks are, where our ship, the ship of state, won't get crushed. But now we have got together and decided what's best for us. Also, he talks about the history of the experience, our own experience. He's talking about what he had said in the memorandum he wrote, I, as I showed you, uh, vices of the political system of the United States. So he says, we've, we've done our homework and we are providing you, we are leaving, we are suggesting you to adopt this constitution because uh, in, as far as human beings are concerned and as fallible as we are, this is the best that can be done for all of us. Among the difficulties encountered by the convention, a very important one must have lain in combining the requisite stability and energy in government with the inviolable attention due to liberty and to the Republican form. Without substantially accomplishing this part of their undertaking, they would have had, they would have very imperfect, imperfectly fulfilled the object of their appointment or the expectation of the public. Yet, that it could not be easily accomplish, accomplished will be denied by no one who is unwilling to betray his ignorance of the subject. Energy in government is essential to that security against external and internal danger and to the prompt and salutary execution of the laws which enter into the very definition of good government. Stability in government is essential to national character and to the advantages annexed to it, as well as to that repose and confidence in the minds of people which are among the chief blessings of civil society. An irregular and mutable legislation is not more, more an evil in itself than it is odious to the people. And it may be pronounced with assurance that the people of this country, enlightened as they are with regard to their nature and interested as the great body of them are in the effects of good government, will never be satisfied till some remedy be applied to the vicissitudes and uncertainties which characterize the state administrations. Okay, I'll, I'll stop reading it here. Remember, he uses the word energy. Hamilton uses the word energy in Federalist 36. He uses it here in 37. And he talks about mutability. I mentioned it in part one. He says, if a government is not stable and does not have energy, it can't do any good for you. It needs energy so that when you authorize it to do something, you give it a responsibility, 
It can do it. It has the tools to do it. Law backs it up. You've given it authority. And when he says stability, he uses the word mutability. This was very, very important to these little founders, especially Madison. He says it in the vices of the political system of the United States. When something is mutable, means it's changeable. It mutates from one thing to another. So a law that you can't count on is not going to give you stability. If you write a law and people know that in three months you're going to change it, they're going to say, well, we, can't, uh, we can't count on this law being here three months from now. So we are not going to invest in projects. We're not going to trust our government. He says, this is the worst thing that can be done to future happiness of the people. And he says, this is what has happened in the last 11 years in these 13 states. A big faction takes over power and forces the state legislatures to write laws that is not in the interest of the community in the long run. So this, he says, this is the worst thing that can be done. So even though this is the middle of the paragraph, I'm going to stop here and I'll continue uh, with this paragraph in the next video.